Hi, welcome back. This, I want to continue with the teaching on Leah. Um, and I, I don't know if we'll finish it in this session or not, but there's so much about her that's so important. And so when we left off last time, we were talking about the fact that Rachel had not conceived a child and she was threatening basically suicide. Get me pregnant or I will die. And Jacob sent her, can I do what God can't do? So we go on from there. Now, when, when Laban gave Leah to Jacob, I mean, of all these names, as a wife, he also gave Leah Zilpah as her, her handmaiden. This was pretty typical that the woman would come into a marriage with a handmaiden. She would help her establish a household and do all kinds of things. And they became best buds. I mean, you know, we have girlfriends that we've become so close to and they know us, uh, they know our households, they know our children, and vice versa. So Zilpah belongs to Leah and Bilhah belongs to Rachel. There is one theory that they might even be half-sisters of Rachel and Leah because they may be Laban's daughters by his concubines. If so, that would keep the bloodline pure. But I don't know whether that's true or not. So you can do with that whatever your head wants you to do with it. Nah, just don't blow it. Okay, so now we have this situation where Rachel is screaming, threatening suicide. She can't get pregnant. And so she comes up on her own scheme. She was a really, really good schemer. Now, to my Jewish friends who might be watching this, I apologize that I have these concepts of Rachel that you don't have. But to me, they're pretty clear here in the Word what we're dealing with here. All right. So we look at this and we see where in her anger and in her in her bitterness and in her desperateness to have a child she rachel says to jacob in chapter 30 verse 3 of genesis here's my maid bilhah go into her that she may bear, bear on my knees that through her i too may have a child so she gave him her maid bilhah as a wife and jacob went into her and Bil bilhah conceived and bore jacob a son and rachel said god has judged me and I'm going to name him Dan. God has judged me, and I'm I'm okay. Yeah, I'm right. So I'm going to name this kid Dan. And so, time goes on, and Rachel's Bill, Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. So she names him Naphtali, and she says, "With mighty wrestlings have I prevailed against my sister." Okay, what about this sister? What about Leah? What's happening with her? She's four little boys. She's busy, busy around the encampment. She's busy taking care of her family. She's busy being the mother of the encampment, which she became when her own mother died. So now she's very busy. And so when she sees what's happening and Jacob's not coming to her anymore, she decides because she gets it. Jacob had told her at some point in their conversation about the family heritage and about the family having to be fruitful and multiply. And she's questioning, well, how can we be fruitful and multiply when Jacob no longer comes into me as his wife? He has Bilhah, he has Rachel. And so he goes to Bilhah when Rachel's not uh, ceremonially clean. And so she's left out, out in the dark. So she decides that in order to comply with God's design for this family, that, to, that they would be fruitful and multiply, she decides to do what her sister did, and she decides to give Zilpah, her handmaiden, to Jacob as a wife. Now, not an easy task to do, because by now these women are really in tight with each other. And how are you going to do this and not create conflict? So we see in verse 9 of chapter 30, When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, How fortunate! So she named him Gad. I'm fortunate. So she named this baby Gad. And then there was a second son. Zilpah bore a second son. And she named him Asher, which means happy. Why would she name him Asher? 
she's not happy. But you know what she says? The women will call me happy because there's another child. And so she names him Happy Asher. And so she goes on with her life, her busyness. Now she has six children, four that she's born on her own tutelage and two that her handmaiden is born to her. Rachel now has two children via her handmaiden. So now we see eight kids running around this encampment. So one day, Rachel, uh, I'm sorry, Reuben, Leah's oldest son, goes out into the field and he comes back with flowers for mom. You know how kids do dandelions, daisies, whatever they see, the neighbor's field, whatever. They'll pick him, come in, flowers for mom. He's old enough to know. So I'm going to say he's maybe five. He comes in with his flowers from mom, screaming, Mom, 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 look what I got for you. And Miss Rachel, who's the Mrs. Kravitz of the, of the encampment, looks out her tent opening and she says, Oh, look what the kid has. And so she goes running down the encampment and she wants these flowers because they're not ordinary flowers. They're mandrakes. And mandrakes, have, they look like the male anatomy, and they're supposed to be an aphrodisiac. And she's, Rachel's convinced that if she has these, she'll get pregnant. Now, she already has two children, surrogate children, but she still wants to conceive, and she still wants to bear a child. She's still not happy. And so she runs forth, and she wants to grab the mandrakes from Reuben, but Leia... Heads are off at the pass. And Leah says, uh -uh. hands off. The kid is mine. The flowers are mine. Cut it. Well, there's nothing quite like sisters going to war. There's an old song, Lord help the mister who comes between me and my sister, and Lord help the sister who comes between me and my man. Well, that's what you have going on here. You have sisters at war over a man. And so they negotiate. And Leah says, all right, let's just do this. You want these mandrakes? Okay, great. But tonight, tonight, I get Jacob in my tent. Tonight's mine. He's all mine. And you can have the mandrakes, and you can go sit in the tent and suck your thumb for all I care. That's gospel according to me. Well... I mean, sisters being sisters. So Rachel takes the mandrakes and says, okay, you get him tonight, but only tonight. Got it? He's mine. And now I'll be able to get pregnant and you're out in left field, baby. So can you just imagine the scene in the encampment? Here comes Jacob in from the shepherd fields and he's tired and he's dirty and he's hungry and all he wants to do is flip on TV. Oh wait, they don't have TV. All he wants to do is just put his feet up and rest. And Leah is watching. Tonight she's Mrs. Kravitz. She's watching that pathway and as soon as she sees him on that pathway, out she goes like lightning. And she says, Hey, tonight you're mine. Tonight, you're coming with me. He says, really? How that happened? He's not opposed to going to her. He likes her. He doesn't love her, but he likes her. But every time he goes to her, he catches holy hat from Rachel. So it's just not worth the effort. And he sees the kids out in the, out in the courtyard and stuff like that. So, all right. So he concedes and he goes in to spend the night with Leah. So he walks in her camp, into her tent. And what happens? Four little boys all lined up nice and clean. Shoes polished, looking good in the neighborhood. And they're very polite. They're well-mannered. They are respectful of their father. They have two stepbrothers. They're respectful of their stepbrothers and, and Zilpah, their whatever step, whatever she is at this point. They're respectful and they're good. Plus there's a fragrance in Leah's tent. There's something special there. For you see, 
she's come to know the one true God. And when she could no longer conceive, because Jacob wasn't coming to her after Judah was born, she just says, nuts to it, I'm praising the Lord. And when she started praising God, the Holy Spirit entered into her life. And she brought order into what was confusion. And out of that order comes this tremendous amount of love and respect and dignity. The very things that were missing in Rachel's tent were found in Leah's tent. And in that finding, Jacob found sanctuary. So he stays the night. And wouldn't you know it, beautiful Leah gets pregnant. And then she has a child, a little boy, and she names him Issachar. Because she said, this is my reward. I wasn't selfish. I gave my handmaiden to Jacob. And God has now rewarded me for that. And now I have a fifth natural child, a little boy, named Issachar, meaning reward. And Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Jacob. Oh, wait, 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 wait. She was only going to get him for that one night. How did she have a sixth child? Well, it seems like Jacob decided to man up. Because you see, when he discovered the peace and the sanctity in the sanctuary of Leah's tent, he began saying to Rachel, bug off. Because I'm going to go over there. I'm going to see my children. I am going to see Leah. I'm going to see the new baby. And guess what? Now there's another baby coming. And the sixth son, natural son of Leah, she names Zebulun. Because she says, now I will have honor. My husband will honor me. He will love me. And then she gets pregnant again. And, and uh, she has a daughter. The only daughter that's recorded that was born to Jacob. Her name is Dina. That's Leah's seventh natural son. Biblically, the number seven is perfection. Dina means justice. God's justice is perfect. I could end the story there, but I won't. Because there's more to it. So, so now we see there's peace and harmony and unity. Jacob goes into Rachel and guess what? Rachel gets pregnant. Hallelujah, Rachel's pregnant. Maybe she'll quit throwing a tantrum. Maybe she'll become a real person now and join in and be a part of everything that's going on in the encampment. But we're talking about Rachel. So Rachel gets pregnant. She bears a son to, jo to Jacob, and she calls him Joseph, which means add another. She's not happy with just one. She wants another one. Well, oftentimes women do when they give birth to their first child. After they've gotten through the throes of giving birth and gotten past that, they want another child right away. It doesn't always happen that way. However, there is a, a form of peace that begins to settle in the compound. She has her baby now. Her arms are full. She can not be so um, devastated by what's going on with her sister and all these babies popping out and, and the maidens and everything. So now we have... All these children, we have 11 sons and one daughter. So they've been, Jacob's been there now 14 years. And so he goes to Laban and he says, All right, I need to do something. I have this huge family here. I have 12 kids. I got to do something about this. And I need to be able to take care of them myself. So I'm asking your permission to leave. And I'm going to go back to, Can to Canaan, to my father's house. And Laban says, oh, well, uh, let's talk here. Let's just talk. And so he makes this deal with Jacob. And he says to Jacob, you know, we know that we've gotten very wealthy since you've been here because you're such a good herdsman. You know how to get the sheep to bear and the goats to bear. And we've grown and we've prospered. So, um... How about if you stay and let's work out this deal where um, I pay you and I don't pay you in money, but I'll pay you in animals and then you'll become a wealthy man on your own. Okay, so they work out the deal and the deal, of course, is typical Laban 
And he says in, in uh, 30, verse 37, it says then Je that he agrees to this deal. And so he's, I'm sorry, verse 35. So Laban says, let it be according to your word. And what they do is they separate all the flock. And Jacob agrees to take all of the spotted and speckled goats and sheep. Most generally, goats are black or white. Brown, I guess. So Jacob says, okay, all right, this is what we'll do. I will take all of these striped, speckled, spotted animals, and you have the rest. And if you find uh, a, a clear one in my herd, then you'll know that it's yours and that I've stolen it from you, and you can take it. So that was the agreement. But what does Laban do? Immediately, he takes all of the striped, speckled, spotted from his herds, and sends them off to another pasture land because he doesn't want Jacob to have them, even though he just agreed to. I mean, he can't do it right. So Jacob catches on. And so what he does then, and this is where I wanted to pick up, in verse 37, then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees, and he peeled white stripes in them, exposing the white which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he peeled in front of the flocks in the gutters, even in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink. And they mated when they came to drink, and then they had babies, and the babies were striped, speckled, spotted, whatever. If they were weak, if they were weak, then he didn't mate them. He just sent them over. To, to Laban, but even if they were weak he, and, it, and they were striped, speckled, or spotted, he kept them because this was his. Well, pretty soon, because God's involved in this whole thing, pretty soon it's Jacob's herds that are growing and Laban's are not because you see Jacob is working out the plans that God has given to him. Well, there begins to be trouble in the camp. And the trouble is called jealousy. And the brothers are realizing, um, hey, he, he's the one. He's the one that's getting all of the, the animals and our herds are depleting and his are growing. And so there's this rumbling and this grumbling going on within the encampment. So one day, Jacob calls the women and he says, come on out. And so they come out and he says, we need to talk. He said, you know, things are not going real well around here. Uh, your dad has uh, deceived me these many times. And uh, I think it's time for us to leave. He said, well, we can. Are you okay, to your wives, are you okay if we hit the road? And they said, yeah, we're okay with that. Because you see, we know our dad. And we know our dad well enough to know that whatever has been given to him has been already spent, gone. He'll never give it back to us. Even though it was initially ours, he's already used it. And so let's go. Let's pack up and let's go. Okay, and so he says, all right, let's get out of, let's get out of here and let's go for Canaan, but let's do it quietly. You get everything packed up. You get the maids ready. You get your servants ready. And we're going to go. When Laban goes to the fields, over here on the other side of the mountain, we're heading out. He wanted to do it secretly. He didn't want conflict. Plus, he was worried. He was worried that Laban would take his daughters away from Jacob. And he apparently had the power to do that. Now, how he could do that after they were married, I don't know. But he apparently had the power to do that. So Jacob said, let's go. Let's go surreptitiously. Let's get out while we can. And so as soon as they were ready to go, Rachel went to her father's quarters and she took her father's gods, his household gods, and she put them in her saddlebags and she got on her camel and they rode off. They went a three days journey this way. Laban was a three days journey this way. In time he caught up with them, they were on the road for a week to 10 days. And you know what happened? He is mad stumps up to them, says, what do you mean taking my girls and my children? The grandchildren are, are Jacob's children, but he says, they're my children. You can't have them. And he said, had your God not spoken to me in a dream, 
I would have wiped you out and I'd have taken them all back and I'd have shown you a thing or two. And so they agree. They're sitting there and they're talking and they're agreeing. However, Laban says, and on top of all that, who stole my household idols? Who stole my household gods? And Jacob is now furious. He says, what do you mean? We don't want your household gods. We don't want anything to do with them. We have the one true God. So he says, you search through this encampment. You know, they're, they're around the campfire. And he said, you search through this encampment. You go through everything. And the person who has your gods will die. I'll see to it. That person will die. So Laban takes off and he searches through the feed sacks and he searches through every tent and every place to go. But when he gets to Rachel's tent, he, she said, in verse 34, she says, Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the saddle, and she sat on them. And Laban fell through all, through all the tents, but he did not find, find them. And then she said, um, Excuse me, Dad, I can't get up. The way of women is on me. I'm like, I'm having my period. I can't get up. And he just looks at her and walks away. Now Jacob's mad. I mean, he is so mad. He has thrown a major showdown conversation with Laban. And so he really tears into him. And in, in verse 36 of chapter 31, he lights into him. And he says, you have felt through all my goods. What have you found? All of your household goods? Set it before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. These 20 years... I have worked for you, and you have cheated me on every possible choice. Every possible moment, you've cheated me. I worked for 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. Do you really think you deserve my respect? I don't think so. And he tore into him like, wow. And I am sure the daughters are sitting back there. Oh, way to go, Jacob. That daddy have it. He deserves it. He has manipulated. He has torn us apart. He has done horrible things to us. He's uh, cheated them in the marriage of the women. Everything he's done, he set out to cheat Jacob, his nephew, his absolute bloodline. He set out to cheat. And now he's coming there accusing them of theft. What else? What he do? How low will he stoop? Jacob is so mad. And so they decide to reach a covenant, and the covenant of Mitzpah. And this is in 31, verse starts in 43. It says, And the labor and answered said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do to these my daughters, to the children? So he said, now because your God told me I had to knock it off, I'm going to knock it off. And he said, let's build a heap of witness. Okay. And so they built this heap of witness. And uh, Laban said, this is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, it was named Galid. And Mitzvah, for he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from the other. You know, have you ever had one of those hearts, you know, the silver hearts? And it looks like it's broken, and one side is half of may the Lord, and it's split down the middle. May the Lord watch between you and me while we're apart one from the other. This is where it comes from, right here, right here. And so he says this, and, and then he says, If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. I mean, he's, he's a godly man. Right. There's nothing godly about Laban. And he said, this is a heap of witness. And the pillar is a witness that I will not pass by this heap to harm you. And you will not pass by this pillar to harm me. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judged between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his kinsmen to the meal. And they ate the meal and spent one night in the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. So what they had here 
was a covenant meal. They finally agreed what to do. And they agreed it, it was maybe a really terse, hot agreement, but they agreed. They came to peace between them. And Jacob knew that he was going to go back to where he came from, and he was taking his wife and his children. So they go on into Canaan. I will, I will digress a little bit here. They go on into Canaan. He's met by Esau. All that stuff comes down. The thing I wanted to point out is, is Rachel is pregnant. She gives birth to her second son, and she dies in the birthing process. And she names her son Benomi, son of my sorrow. And Jacob said, no, nah, no, no, we're not doing this. He's not son of your sorrow, even though that you're dying, giving him birth. He is the son of my right hand. He is my son, and his name is Benjamin. And then we I want to fast forward now to Genesis chapter 50. And this is the death of Israel, who is Jacob. Jacob and Israel are one person. And Joseph fell on his father's face and wept. And he, uh, he said, uh, actually chapter 49, he says to Joseph, as he knows he's dying, they're in Egypt. He said, take me back. Take me back to the cave where I buried Leah. Take me back to the cave where Abraham buried Sarah, where Isaac buried Rebecca, and where I buried Leah. And it comes down to the simple fact. He had buried Rachel right where she died at Ephrath of Bethlehem, not that far away from Hebron. But he buried Leah in the cave with the ancestors. Because you see, she became the real queen of Israel, the mother of Israel. She became the one who gave life and love and security to the sons of Jacob. Shalom, shalom.